Hi, everyone. Very nice to be here tonight. Thanks for braving the weather. I know that it's uh, not always the most pleasant to walk around in what is like the least pleasant weather, which is just the like barely rain that doesn't quite justify an umbrella. Um, <laughs> I want to just uh, first say I'm going to try and keep my foul language to a minimum. I have a little bit of a like nervous tick about it, but be thankful because I used to have a really annoying nervous laugh, which got replaced by cursing, so I think the cursing is a little better than me going, ah, like all night long. And uh, I will also say, if it looks like the Holy Spirit is speaking to me at any point in the night, it's just me having a sciatica attack, like in the middle of being in front of you guys. So I, I'm hoping that doesn't happen, but I've been on my feet a lot, and then my balance has changed a little bit over the last few months. So if, if all of a sudden I just kind of like make a little spasm, that's probably what that's about. So uh, the title of my talk tonight, I, I kind of go by two different titles. So remember the analog is kind of like the funnier, cheesier version of it. Um, and sketch to screen is the one that's a little more um, literal. So I really like being able to kind of use both because people that don't really get the remember the analog joke will then understand that, oh, sketches, I understand. We will be looking at drawings. Makes sense. Um, and to give you guys a little background about what I do and what you're in for tonight, so um, I do lettering and type design primarily. I started off as a, you know, a kid that loved to draw like anyone else. So I was not a reader when I was growing up. Like I liked books just fine, but I was the quiet kid in the corner with like a pen and paper that my, I was like the ideal child for my parents because my brother was just a hellion. And all they had to do was make sure that I had plenty of art supplies and I would just stay alone and draw all day long by myself for six or eight hours a day. So hopefully, like, our future proud me will do the same thing. Not that I don't want them to be awesome and run around and make a mess of the house, but. Um, so I always knew I wanted to pursue art because it was really the thing that I just was, al it, it was always my passion. I can't remember a time where I didn't love drawing and it wasn't really the biggest part of my day. So um, when I was in high school, I went to Catholic school actually until 10th grade and then um, would have stayed the whole way through except um, the school didn't really focus on art at all. So there was an art track that was basically like visual art one through four, but it became really clear just in my first art class that like anybody taking the art classes were just the football players looking for an easy A. So visual art one was basically 13 male football players and then me and my friend Caroline like trying to make the most out of the class. Which made for like a very entertaining year because poor Mr. Ron who was you know in some sort of, he was in a blues band called Route 66 and they used to like uh, ransom note style put captions on his podium that he did not know about like the entire time while he was teaching. It was a riot but very disrespectful. And uh, as you can imagine, you know, you're not learning that much when like all the high school senior football dudes are making jokes all class long. So when I was in the 10th grade, um, I tried to set, sign up for another art class, you know, thinking like, oh, of course, like I'm gonna be able to take the other art classes because that's what I wanna do later. And my guidance counselor wouldn't even let me sign up for the class because they were like, actually, we're changing the curriculum. We gotta double down on sciences. So you're gonna not be able to take art this semester. And I was like, but that is literally the only thing I want to do after school. What kind of guidance counselor are you? So I ended up transferring to public school specifically just to take more art classes. So, um, which was actually the best decision I could have made because even though it was, you know, taking me from a really small, you know, more prestigious school basically with 120 kids in the graduating class, then moving over to a class where I graduated with 850 students, which is quite a jump. Um, I was able to really immerse myself in art classes, and I had just the best art teacher that you could imagine. She was a drill sergeant of an art teacher. So anytime that people signed up for the class and thought there was going to be a blow-up class, or a blow-up class, she would just give the most homework assignments. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you had a weekend full of like, draw your toothbrush, draw your toothpaste, draw your shoe, blah, blah, blah. And you'd have to come back with just this full sketchbook full of stuff. So it was impossible to goof off, and it, I just loved it. I loved that I actually had to like leave school and had assignments to do. And so I took probably like six or seven art classes between 11th and 12th grade, but even then, I felt so far behind with all the students at the public school 
Because if you guys um, you know, have attended public school or anything like that, I know there's school here as a part of the university, but in public school, you can graduate with like a 4.8 GPA. I, ne I did not understand that at all. So I got to call, I got to, uh, I transferred over and I had like a 3.8 or something like that, you know, like not like the world's most impressive GPA, but certainly not anything crappy. And then I was still like number 300 in the class because everybody else had been taking AP classes and getting like crazy extra credit. So all the top 150 students or like 100 students that I graduated with all had over 4.0 GPAs, which, you know, if you understand math, makes a lot of sense. Um, so I felt, I felt like I was really far behind, and even though I was really trying really hard to kind of catch up and really focus on my art stuff, I felt even with the art, I was far behind because I wasn't able to take the, these classes the whole way through. I wasn't, you know, going to the colleges on the weekends and taking these like epic, you know, college level courses that a lot of the other applicants to the schools were taking. I was also, like, my parents got divorced when I was 14, and my mom, like, never made more than 20 grand when I was in high school, so I had maybe about $5,000 saved for college right when I was about to leave for school. Had a crazy kidney infection that they were saying that was not an emergency, and had an $18,000 hospital bill that took two years to resolve. And so the whole, I was like, I am not going to be able to go to art school. How is this going to function? And as I'm having all these thoughts, I uh, was in school, and the, uh, my, my teacher would have universities come in and like review portfolios, because since we were a bigger high school, they would do that. And Keystone College, which is a university in Pennsylvania that it's kind of like in between a full university and associate program. And they saw my portfolio and said, you know, we don't think you're quite ready. And so I basically got turned down from like the just past community college level when I was a senior. And I was like, what am I gonna do? I can't even go to the community college. And so when Tyler School of Art came to visit, the, uh, the admissions counselor from Tyler School of Art, who like, I hadn't really heard much of the school because I only really, I was like any teenager where I only heard of the famous ones and then just was lazy and didn't research anything else. And uh, my teacher was like, no, this school's amazing. They, you know, they're smaller. They're not like these big New York schools that, you know, everybody knows about or whatever, but it's a really great program and like the teachers are awesome. So they're really hyping me up and I'm like, that's all great, you know, Miss Glowatch, but I got turned down from community college. I don't know what's gonna happen here. So um, the admissions council reviewed my portfolio and they came in and my teacher put in a huge word for me and was like, you know, I know that she only has eight or 10 pieces right now and that, you know, it doesn't reflect a mature uh, portfolio full of work. And if any of you guys want to see what some of my high school work looked like, I have a Tumblr blog set up called I Can Has Art School. Um, <laughs> and that's H-A-Z, so in case you want to find that, it's pretty easy to find. Um, but you know, it, just, it wasn't to the level of what some of the other applicants were. And uh, But Carmina, the admissions counselor, um, was like, you know, uh, Ms. Gloss really vouches for you. She says that you work harder than any student she's ever had, and we'd love to admit you to the program. So, and she just told me that that day, like right when she looked at my portfolio, and all of a sudden it felt like everything changed, you know? <sighs> Pregnancy on the sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and so um, I ended up at Tyler, and it was awesome. It was this weird, like now the, the campus is actually down at Temple University main campus, which makes it a really, really different environment. But at the time, it was this little tiny, old, like 1920s campus um, in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, surrounded by total ghetto. Like, you just could not leave the campus without being like a little bit afraid for your life. Um, and I say that not in like a way that I'm like being judgmental or anything. It was like legit, there were shootings in the apartment complexes next by, you know, so it was pretty, it was a funny place to be, you know. Um, but because of that, because it was kind of isolating, it was wonderful, you know, because we just were all trapped together. It was like being on a cruise line art school, you know, where like no one's allowed to leave. I keep saying that, like, you know, they do all these design conferences in like, you know, Austin and like places that people actually want to visit. They need to do a design conference cruise because then like everybody's just on the boat and nobody can leave. So you just end up having this awesome social time and you don't have to worry about people kind of, oh, never mind, I'm gonna go to the mid all day instead, whatever. Um, so, anyway.
long, long story. So I ended up in graphic design at the school. I had no idea what graphic design was at all. Um, they taught graphic design at my high school, but it was part of the VOTEC that was across the street. And the VOTEC was mostly the students that had gotten kicked out of the private schools and then now had to go to VOTEC. So there was this big stigma about crossing the street to go to the VOTEC. So um, I never took any of the graphic design classes because it just seemed like they were grouped in with the automotive classes. And I didn't care too much about what people thought about me. And um, so when I got to school, everyone was like, you should try taking a graphic design class. And all the art, fine art students were like, yeah, if you want to sell out. And I was like, I don't know. And so I was like, may as well try it. Why not, you know? And so I took a graphic design class, and I really felt like that's where I found myself. Um, and part of it was, you know, when I was 18, I was making like crappy paintings about my feelings and stuff, and thinking that nobody wanted to look at them. And I, you know, even with having, you know, a little bit of baggage, you know, growing up, everybody has their own baggage, and you know, that baggage is worth sharing with people because then we all get to unite in our baggage and feel good about our baggage. Um, I, th I was like, man, I haven't lived enough to make good art. You know, like I don't have some tortured past or some mental illness or all these things that make for really good art. Um, so I was like, how am I going to continue doing this when I don't actually feel like I have an opinion yet? I'm 18, I, I haven't lived, I, you know, grew up in PA, but, you know, reasonable means, you know, it's not like I was struggling or whatever, you know, I, I never had to worry about where I was living, had to worry about how I was going to put food on the table and stuff like that. So graphic design was a way for me to make art without having to be all about me. So we would get these assignments and everything was about problem solving. You know, you, you would get an assignment, whether it was like for a fake restaurant or for an editorial assignment or something like that, and you got to take yourself out of the equation. It wasn't like, how is my experience of the restaurant? You know, it's not about you, it's about how you want people, or how the client wants people to perceive the restaurant, which I thought was really cool. It's kind of like theater, but you know, like in a visual arts kind of way. And then so that's and how I ended up in graphic design. And you know, as you guys that are in the graphic design track know, graphic design is very much about typography. But as a graphic designer, um, you have a really hard time explaining what you do to people. And so I would come home and you know have the same problems that everybody has, where they're like, "Oh, I love that thing you made. Like, did you draw the drawing? No. Did you take the photograph? No. Well, what did you do? And they're like, I arranged it all. Kind of like." Flower arranging, but, you know, with words, and uh, so and but what was great was that my school was small. We didn't have access to like all these crazy libraries and stuff. Like Philadelphia is a great resource, but it was kind of a pain to get downtown and you know actually use them. So and this was like you know not as advanced internet as right now as well. So you guys all have like everything at your fingertips like crazy, and I would you know like Google was not really the the giant that it is now. Um, so I would end up creating a lot of my own assets just because I was broke and because it took too much time to like take the bus for 40 minutes downtown to go to like the image library or something to find something. So I ended up making a lot of illustration and making a lot of my own letter forms for projects. And it was through doing so that I really realized that like, oh wait, you know, this whole time all I've wanted to do in my whole life is just to be a person that makes images which is really what we do when we're kids when we're drawing, right? You're a person that makes images. And through like illustration and lettering, I was able to sort of like take the part of graphic design that I love, which was working for other people and having these problems to solve, and then take the other thing that I love, which was drawing, and combine it into a career. So, um, and the further I got along in that, the more specific my career kind of got. So um, now I do lettering and type design, uh, to explain what those things are to you, everybody uses the word type for everything. So I have this tattoo that says type on my arm, but it's actually lettering, so all the nerds get very upset and make comments and stuff. And I'm like, oh, whatever, everybody's allowed mistake tattoos, you have to have those. And, uh, but so type, people use type as kind of umbrella, an umbrella term right now, but it really, type is used for type design and fonts and stuff like that which is kind of like the architecture engineering side of the type world. And then the lettering people are like your uncle that makes a really badass uh, dollhouse, you know? Like he's not gonna mass produce that dollhouse. That's not the intention. 
He's going to make this one beautiful thing, and it exists just for that purpose, just for you, and then he moves on, and that's that. So every time that he makes something good, or she, your crazy aunt that makes like grades for everything, um, not speaking of personal experiences, <laughs> um, they make a thing, and they don't think like, how am I going to make that exact thing again forever and give it to everyone? They think, I'm making this thing right now in this moment, and it's perfect for this specific location in my house, and then I'm going to move on and make something else that's better for this specific location. So letterers get assignments to create type typographic works that are meant to be used in a very, very specific way. And we're different than calligraphers because letterers draw and calligraphers write. So that's the main difference. So calligraphy is writing and lettering is drawing. And the reason why that makes a difference is just how long it takes to do stuff. Like calligraphers basically spend all their time training their hand so that they have this muscle memory. So every time they get hired for an assignment, they can make something perfectly the first time off. You would not want to hire a letterer to do your wedding envelopes because we would take forever and they would all be screwed up and different from each other. But a calligrapher can make everything beautiful and consistent the whole way through because they have that practice behind them. So here's a bit of my arsenal. Um, I'm going to come closer to my computer so I can read stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, so these are sort of the analog tools that I end up using for the most part. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but I do have a couple of pencils that I love. I tend to use uh, technical pencils, just those little click pens. I have a fancy one up here on the screen because there's a stationery store that's entirely too close to my studio. And, um, but you can use those cheapy big pens, they're amazing. And then um, these black wing pencils are my favorite ever. And so they're this really soft lead and they're just they're cool because they have this kind of architecture pencil thing going on with the, with the eraser that's square, and it just you look like you're a professional human when you're using that pencil. <laughs> um, I discovered this thing called a pencil extender, which I never knew what those were for until I started using $2 pencils and was like, well, I don't want to throw away the pencil when all of a sudden my hand is cramping up by trying to hold a tiny pencil. Um, so you can basically just pop the eraser off and then throw that into the extender and you have a little pencil again. It's pretty cool. And then in terms of uh, pens, I have a, a fair amount of brush pens that I work with, usually just for doing experimental stuff if I want to do brush styles. I'm not a calligrapher, I'm terrible at calligraphy. Um, but I do like to mess around with it because you get cool, fun mistakes uh, that can be really great in, if, you know, in the right context that way. And then of course, just the ballpoint pen. Um, I love pencil sharpeners that you actually have to like sharpen it yourself rather than an electric pencil sharpener. I think the electric pencil sharpeners, they sharpen too much of the pencil, so it ends up getting really, really sharp, and then your point breaks a lot, so you spend your whole day, like, <laughs> all day long. And I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but these, like, have you heard these stories of, like, coffee snobs going on planes and, like, taking their French press and, like, making a French press thing on a plane because they're, like, care that much about coffee? <laughs> What I don't want to do is be that person on the plane trying to get a sketch assignment done, being like, <laughs> like right next to some other person that's like, who is this crazy person? Uh, so these little analog sharpeners are my favorite. There's a company called Dux, that's, uh, it's D-U-X, that's a German company, and they make these really pretty glass bottom ones that come in a few different colors. You can usually get them in art stores. Um, but they have this uh, um, stainless steel one that is so cool, and it is just a beautiful object. It's one of my favorite things I've ever owned. It was like $30 or something, like way more expensive than a pencil sharpener should ever be. But good God, that thing brings me so much joy. It sits on my desk, and it casts this beautiful little light onto my desk, and every time I think about it, I'm like, oh, I love my pencil sharpener. Um, everything, of course, goes in a little pencil case. Um, and then these, uh, like, I usually carry an extra eraser on me because otherwise you end up being that person that just burns through erasers at the end of your pencil before your pencil's done, and then you're, like, adding stuff on and having a vial of whatever. It's too much. And uh, a little small ruler helps for making guidelines when I'm drawing. And then of all of the apps I've discovered for the iPhone or for iPad or whatever, you know, Adobe is doing their best to, like, make awesome, like, drawing apps and stuff for the iPad. But um, I'm... I try them and I want to get into it, but I, what I don't want is for digital stuff to take over more of my life than it already has. Um, so that's why this whole remember the analog thing is a, is a big deal to me. But an app that is going to blow your minds is called Scanner Pro. 
And it's just really, really good at taking a sketch um, and turning it into what looks like a really perfect scan, like a black and white scan. It takes about four seconds and it costs like $2.99 or something like that. And it has made me look like a professional person to my clients. Um, because I used to just take iPhone photos and they were all blurry and weird and grayscale. And then occasionally I would get a client that would be a little upset with me because I wasn't like putting it into a proper deck with like little notes all over everything and whatever. But this thing, you just take some quickie photos, it puts it in a PDF, you look like a real professional. As far as a sketchbook, the only things that I would say is like don't get a little tiny, tiny sketchbook. Those are great for ideas, but you need room to spread around. And by all means, if you're the kind of person that does a sketch in a sketchbook and then is like, the whole book is ruined, we have to throw it away, I've destroyed this notebook, do not use a sketchbook. You are not a sketchbook person. Um, it took me a while to be someone that was okay to have a sketchbook because I'm sure if you guys are in art school now, you guys have some art school friends that um, have these sketchbooks that are really just basically final assignments inside a book, but it's like a gouache painting, like with beautiful, well curated notes and stuff all around it, and you're like, this is just unfair. Like, what? where are your ideas? There are no ideas here. These are all final art pieces. So I got really hung up on that when I was starting out, and I was afraid to keep a sketchbook, so I just drew everything on scrap paper. So if you are a person that, like, has a lot of notebooks that have like five things in them and then you stop because you just can't stare at it anymore because it bothers you that it's there. Don't use a sketchbook until you don't have that problem anymore. Um, eight by 10 or larger is what I would recommend. I like nine by 12 as a size. I think that they work great. And one thing that I would say too is like, don't worry about getting those sketchbooks that have the super thick pages that you can't see through because a little bit of transparency in your page makes a lot of sense sometimes. Um, these books that I use, um, I'm from this company, Leuchtturm, and the only reason I do is because they're like easy to find at the art store, you know. And um, they, I, I like the paper better than the moleskins, just because it's hard to hard to find the larger moleskins with the this more transparent paper. And but what what I really love is that these guys come with a sheet of paper that is gridded on one side and lined on the other. So if you put it behind your page, you instantly get gridded paper. What I don't recommend is working with gridded notebooks because if you work with gridded notebooks, everything you make is gonna look like rectangles. Because it's, we're like, you know, we love to organize stuff. Human beings are like natural, like liner uppers of stuff. And if you have a gridded notebook, everything you make will be like 10 units high by two units wide by one unit next to each other just because it's impossible to ignore the grid. So I really like to have the grid occasionally, like when I'm starting a project and I want to get a layout down, but then I have to get rid of it because if I have it the whole time that I'm drawing, I'm not making work that like optically feels right, I'm making work that mechanically is right, and then I could be anybody. You know, if you're following the rules that strictly and making stuff that is like exactly two centimeters by exactly five centimeters, you could be anybody. You know, it's, it's through the little imperfections that really your work is going to stand out from other people's work. And you don't need to buy these fancy notebooks with this fancy paper in it. You can make this gridded paper however you want. And you can actually make all kinds of grids and just have them around to stick behind your page. It's really a good way to work. Um, so in terms of hardware, um, I use a MacBook Pro. I used to have a separate computer for my office, and then I had a laptop when I was traveling. But it's just a nightmare managing files. So it's a lot easier just to keep one computer. And then I use an extra display at my office because no one has good enough eyesight to work on a tiny computer all the time. Or maybe you do, but whatever. I have to wear glasses now. Um, I use a Wacom uh, tablet, but not because I think that they're the most amazing thing in the whole universe, but because they gave me one for free, and then now I'm screwed and I can't not use it. Because I got used to using it, and that's that. <laughs> Uh, so I used to work with just a mouse. I definitely still work with the trackpad on my laptop uh, quite a bit when I'm traveling. But um, I do find that Wacom tablets are amazing for Photoshop work. So if you work in Photoshop a lot, a Wacom is the way to go because you can basically paint like with your hand as if you were really drawing. But when you're doing vector work, vector work, um, you're plotting points individually, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And there's just so much tense hovering when it comes to a Wacom that sometimes you might end up feeling like you are more prone to carpal tunnel if you actually are holding like a pen instead of just like resting your hand on a mouse. Um, and one of the biggest things that I would say that everybody should have as a graphic designer is a laser printer. 
um, which seems like the weirdest thing to say because they're not like the top technology thing that you would think that a designer should have. But it's really different than having an inkjet printer because when you have an inkjet printer, the ink kind of bleeds onto the page a little bit and forgives some of your errors. Um, but when you have a laser printer, that toner hits that page just super crisply. So if you have not the best vector drawing, you will see you're not the best vector drawing. So having just a black and white laser printer for really cheaply and quickly outputting your work so that you can judge it on a page is really important. Um, I'm sure that you guys, you know, when writing papers and stuff like that, you run the spell checker of Kingdom Come, yet still the second that you print out the paper, you notice the two does next to each other, and like the computer just doesn't see it, like, or your 12th friend that read your paper still didn't see it. And we just have something going on in our brains that when we see stuff on the computer, we know that it can still be edited and changed, so we don't get that panic, that like, oh, this is final, this must be perfect panic that happens when you see something printed out. And I think that printing out your work and judging it as a physical thing is really important because you see stuff that you will not see on the screen. Like there's just something that happens to your brain that makes you see it. And then um, as far as software, I mostly use Adobe Illustrator. That's kind of a leading thing in, in vector drawing. And so most of the terms that I'll be talking about when it comes to vector drawing are going to be real familiar to anyone that's opened that program. Um, but I also use Robofont, which is a font design program. Um, and so lettering is I mostly do in Illustrator because everything's one off. It's not about making a system. But for making typefaces, you can for sure make like a typeface in Illustrator just by making a full alphabet and then just be dragging and dropping forever to actually create the words and that would technically count as a typeface. But um, in the, these programs, you can make actual typeable fonts, which is really fun. And they're pretty intuitive, all things considered. RoboFont's the most expensive one, um, and I only got into using it because I tried out Glyphs app, and at the time it wasn't as good as it is now. And a bunch of my nerd friends were like, RoboFont's the way to be, so I spent 600 euro or whatever it was on it. Um, but now Glyphs app is really great, and they sell a light version through the app store that you can really try it out, and um, I think they also do student discounts. And then Font Lab Studio was kind of the like industry standard before all of a sudden these other two kind of started taking over. And then Scanner Pro, like I said. So here's an outline of what my process looks like. So I start by researching, um, which really means reading, um, visual inspiration searching. And sometimes I'm the one that does that, and sometimes my client's the one that does that. It depends on what kind of assignment I'm working on. So if I'm working on an advertising project, usually by the time I'm hired, a lot of the initial research and brainstorming and mood boards and pitching has already been done. So an advertising agency comes to me and says, hey, we just sold this idea to the client and we really want you to be the person to execute it, what do you think? And I'm like, that sounds awesome because advertising pays really well compared to everything else. <laughs> and you definitely get a little upset if you don't get to use your brain all the time, but sometimes it's okay not to use your brain all the time. Because um, I get to use my brain on advertising projects in different ways, just not in the like, I've come up with the smartest, most perfect idea for this assignment way that you get to do for editorial work or for book covers. Um, for brainstorming, I create word association lists. I really like to brainstorm in a verbal way rather than a visual way because I feel like if I think about brainstorming visually, I just get really tied into like, I just really need to draw a slice of pizza right now, you know, like, and all of a sudden, whether or not the slice of pizza has anything to do with the idea, I just can't let it go, you know what I mean? So um, when I brainstorm, I, after I read, after I do whatever, after I look through the client's mood boards or have a really good conversation with them, then I'll just write down any word that comes to mind when it has to do with the project. So um, you know, if I'm brainstorming something about Christmas, I'll be like, Christmas trees, Christmas lights, angels, stars, you know, and just make these lists that make me look like an insane person. So I, at one point, I was gathering all of these into like I had just like my brainstorming journal and my sketch, my sketchbook. But the brainstorming journal, I was like, if anyone found this, I would be institutionalized. <laughs> so now I just mostly do it on this sleep paper. Um, thumbnail sketching, I don't always do. I do it mostly when I'm working with um, a complicated phrase that has a really specific layout. So if you're working on like the masthead of a of a website or something, and you have a 15 word phrase to deal with. It's complicated to get everything in there and make sure the hierarchy is right. So you don't want to just jump into sketching without trying out a few different layouts first. 
Um, and then with sketching, I use those two different kinds of pencils. So first I start sketching with my technical pencil because it's really easy to erase. And then um, I'll use that to lay down guides and to sort of like draw the skeletal forms of what I'm working on. And then once everything is kind of sketched in, then I'll use my super dark, I mean business pencil to make it nice and, uh, you know, like a more final looking thing that I can then scan and so show to my client. And then lastly, uh, I do the vector drawing, which all usually happens in Illustrator. So after all these stages, I'm building in sessions for critique. And that's something that you really miss a lot once you're out of school, that you have to actively pump into your life. Because when you're in school, you sort of take for granted how much time you spend talking about your work and how much time you spend analyzing it and having to defend it. And then when you're off on your own, especially when you don't really have to show anything in between the, uh, your, you know, when you get the assignment and the sketch or when you're sketching and then the final, um, you need to build in times for you to walk away, to put it up on the wall and to judge it and see what you think about it. So um, really breaking down your process. You don't have to follow my exact way that I work, of course, because everybody has their own process and it takes time to figure it out. But any time that you can put, like, put in some breaks for you to step away is really good. For me, I really like to do my research on a different day than I do my brainstorming, on a different day than I do my drawing. And what that does is, it's like anything when you have this, like, if you went to bed and were like, oh my god, I'm going to make a t-shirt brand about blah, and like, it's like, you're like, this is the best idea, time to invest $50,000 into this amazing idea, and you wake up in the morning and go, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, you need to have those, you need to have the sleep on it moments where you get to say, what was I thinking in the morning, and weed out all the cheesy stuff that you are sort of naturally prone to do. And so making sure that you build in enough time to separate your process out so you're not all cramming it into one massive marathon session is probably smart. So again, with researching, um, I don't do this all on the computer. I think like the computer is super limiting. Um, basically, like as much as everything in the universe is on the computer, there's a lot of stuff that isn't. You guys have an amazing research, resource called Hat Show Print here in town, which if I were living here, I would just be like at their door, like, please let me in, I will write you cake, you know, like every day. Um, and I think like what's really good about places like Hatch or libraries is that it takes you away from the computer. The computer is the distraction machine. You know, computers are amazing because we can do all of our work on it and they expedite your process and they connect you to all humans all over the earth and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. But it's really easy to get distracted in whatever it is that you're doing and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, I've been looking at shoes for three hours, you know, like, when did that happen? I only clicked a link in the sidebar, you know. And <laughs> so making sure that you have research time that is away from the distraction machine is important. Um, and also making sure that when you're researching, you're doing it agnostic of a project sometimes. Like, if you're only saving your time for research for when you're working on an assignment, you're going to end up, like, ripping off your research really easily, right? Because if you're like, I'm going to do a poster about mid-century modern design, and then you look at mid-century modern design for, like, you know, four or five hours, chances are you're probably going to accidentally make something really similar to something that you just looked at. Whereas if you take the opportunity when there's a mid-century modern design show in town just to see it, whether or not you have anything to do with that going on on your client assignment calendar at the moment, you can pull from that in the future. And when you do, it's going to be like tempered with all this other stuff in your life so that you're not going to directly rip it off. You're going to be like, I think I remember there being this really great orange red in this one poster. And then all of a sudden you're pulling from your inspiration in a much more organic way rather than a more direct way. So the word association lists, like I said, make me look crazy. So they tend to look like this, just I have like, um, I print in like all caps for the most part, that's like what my handwriting is. My husband and I have really creepily similar handwriting. Um, though mine is much more schizophrenic than his because I'll switch back and forth between like script and print a lot and he's like, I have no idea why you do that, but you do. Um, or anytime that a word ends in L-Y, it always is script, so it'll be like, you know, smartly and smart as all caps in L-Y script. There's just for no reason. Um, but I, like, this is one of my favorite parts of, of working, and I just really love being able to just sit there and just, like, brain dump onto a page. It's, it's really fun. 
And this is sort of like the primordial ooze of ideas, right? Because I'll write down things that seem totally different from each other, but then all of a sudden, if you circle like two of these things on the page, you know, when you're dealing with the same topic, this was for a bunch of cards for Samsung, so they're all over the map. Um, but all of a sudden, like, reef and like, you know, something about children or whatever is gonna like, oh, maybe that could gel to be this crazy different idea that's not just like a wreath with a whatever on it. Um, so you end up coming up with kind of like weird ideas by just combining two different words in your brainstorming list. Uh, for thumbnail sketches, like I said, it's usually for um, complicated layouts, though when I get a more open-ended assignment and I get to do whatever I want, um, which doesn't happen all that much, and I actually usually hate those projects. Like I said earlier, um, I went to, I ended up being a graphic design major because I like the restraint. I like the constrictions. I like uh, someone giving me an assignment and giving me a problem to solve, especially if they give me like really weird production constraints, like only use two colors, or we don't have paper somehow. You know, like there, you know, <laughs> there's something, and I'm like, I'll figure it out, you know? <laughs> Um, but when I work for Paperless Post, which is an online invitation company, and they make these like really beautiful, cool, interactive online invitations, that I get like, make us a bunch of Christmas cards, and then like, what do you do when you can literally make anything for someone? So I do thumbnails just to explore different ideas that I might want to make a final as, and then I go through and I select from those thumbnails which ones I want to make into more finalized sketches. So. Um, so th these are some of the thumbnails that I had done and then some of the more finalized looking sketches, which, you know, because this client lets me do whatever I want, these sketches are really just for my benefit. They're not for the client, because usually when I'm doing sketches that are more finished looking, they're because I have to sell the idea to the client. But what I've come to find is that this part of the, um, of the process really works for me all the time because I'm basically doing most of the legwork up front, so then when I get into the production of actually making it, I can be in like la la zen mode when I'm on the computer and I don't have to be doing a lot of heavy thinking and problem solving as I'm working, which is why I'm able to marathon so much crappy television. <laughs> so the second that I get past this and into vector artwork creation, it is all SVU all the time or whatever it is that I'm watching at the moment. It's really good. And then um, when I'm doing thumbnails for different layouts and stuff, a lot of times I'll have um, you know, a phrase that's pretty complicated, I want to make sure that it's reading right. So I'll do a lot of thumbnails that sort of just show different ways that I could call out words. And I was explaining to some students earlier today that one of the things that I, this is like the nerdiest thing that you could possibly do. Um, but one of the things I really like to do to test if, if something's reading right is to read it as if, um, like use the volume of my voice, as if like the size of the type is affected by the volume of my voice. <laughs> So if the, if the hierarchy's wrong, um, I'm not going to read it correctly. So uh, in the case of the, the second from the left, it's like the work you do when you procrastinate is probably the work you should be doing for the rest of your life. You know? So I'm like, is that right? Did I do that right? Or you know, a lot of times you'll see if you pay too much attention to the size of uh, like um, connecting words or like, like the does and the ofs and stuff like that. It reads really weird because you're like, the best thing to do. You know, like it's just really good. You're like, that's the wrong word to emphasize. Um, so with sketching, again, I usually start light and then I uh, refine from there. So when people look through my sketchbooks, they're usually like, oh my god, how do you draw it so perfect every time? And I'm like, you have no idea how much erasing goes into these. Because I start so, so light. It's really just like, so light on the page I can barely see it, and then I build it up from there. So rather than doing a lot of iteration or using a lot of tracing, tracing paper, I'll like basically just uh, spend a lot of time just letting it emerge from the same image. So when you look through my sketchbook, it looks like I'm just like pretty awesome at drawing first go, but it really there's so many just eraser uh, like stuff all over my part of my uh, studio. I don't even know what to describe that as like all the the waste, eraser waste, the waster, I don't know. <laughs> um, so to show kind of how that process um, looks, like, so I'll usually draw these kind of guidelines, and it's a lot lighter than this, usually the one on the left, so this is a little um, emphasized for your amusement and use. 
Um, so I start by, I use my ruler to draw anything straight, obviously, but then I freehand anything that's on an arc. If I wanted to be a real crazy person about it, I could use French curves and all that kind of stuff, but I actually kind of like it being a little funky. And um, then I'll uh, draw what is called like a skeleton, which is just basically the bare bones of what you're doing. So if you think about letter forms and how they're broken down, you can really break them down in, a, in this very like body specific way. So there's the skeleton, which is just the super bare bones structure of the letter form, right? And that is what really like tells you so much about what the letter's gonna look like. And if you start by building up your letter forms this way, you're gonna end up making work that's a lot different. Because what I do find, and I saw this in my own work like crazy, is that if you're not varying the skeleton at all, you end up drawing letter forms that are just like the same exact alphabet with little doodads stuck on it in different ways. So all of my early lettering assignments, assignments, uh, anytime that I did them for school, I'm like, oh my god, look at all these crazy alphabets I drew. They're so different from each other. They're the same exact alphabet, except like this one has serifs and this one has little balls on it and this one is whatever. And it's because I wasn't changing the skeleton. So um, the next is the body, which is like the meat and the muscle and the fat that you think of. So when you see these super families of typefaces, ones that have like 10 fonts, you know, in the, within the thing, there's like the super light all the way to the ultra wave. It's the same kind of skeletal forms and then it has just different weight applied to it. So if you think about it in terms of something that has a really, really identifiable skeleton, think about like a dachshund, like the dog. So if you had a dachshund, and that dachshund weighed 150 pounds, which is a lot for a dachshund. <laughs> you would still recognize that thing as a dachshund because uh, you know it, it just has that skeleton that is completely the most recognizable dog skeleton. You know, it's it's so so different from a Chihuahua and from a Great Dane and from whatever. Like you would know instantly, no matter whether that thing weighed 10 pounds or weighed 150 pounds, you would know what kind of dog it was. And so that's why the skeleton matters so much in, in letter forms. And so what's really good about that then too is that when you're working in a layout, that really does a lot to determine what the letter form shapes are gonna take. Because in this case, I ended up having to do like work as a much wider, um, like a much more extended version of a, a, a letter form rather than procrastinate because if procrastinate was as wide as work, it would mean that the word procrastinate would have to get really small because it would just be like well beyond the scope of the page. So in order for me to make procrastinate take as much space as it could on the page, the letter forms had to get a lot thinner. So that's sort of how you can start thinking about making decisions about letter forms. It happens in a very, very like utilitarian way. You're like, I need this word to be this size, therefore I have these constraints, so the letter forms have to be taller. And then on the right, you can see after I've done um, a bit more of the proper drawing on it and made some decisions about how some cool your dads are going to get applied. So I made a video of myself drawing a different assignment, so that you can see sort of how that goes. So as you can see, I'm working really, really light first, while I'm still kind of figuring stuff out. And because this was just the words SF, I did not have to draw guides and stuff like that. And then using my bigger pencil afterwards. craziest draftsman, like if you, I would never be able to take my drawings and like immediately translate them to final artwork because I try to get them as tight as I can, but I'm not a robot. And it's not that you have to be a robot to make incredibly tight drawings, but you either need to be a robot or you need to have like 25 years experience doing really tight drawings. So I don't have those. I've been out of school since 2006. And as much as I try to practice as much as I can, like to be the kind of person that can draw the logo like perfect to the point where you can't tell if it's vector or you can't tell if it's a drawing. Um, that just takes a lot of time. <coughs> so when I'm vector drawing, I'm doing it from scratch using the pen tool in Illustrator. So you can absolutely use auto trace and stuff like that for you know parts of an assignment, but if anybody's ever used live trace in Illustrator, um, the shortcomings of it are that you don't have any control over where the points go when it's just like tracing your artwork and you end up with artwork that has like 
a bajillion vector points all over it. And if you want to make any changes to that, like maybe all of a sudden you decide that the whole thing needs to be bolder, or you decide that, wow, now that I'm seeing this in black and white vector art, I realize all these problems that are going on in my sketch that I now want to correct that I'm vector. And you'd think it would be like the faster solution to live trace it, because then you're just editing. But it actually is so much more time consuming to edit something that has like bad structure to it in the first place versus just drawing it from scratch. And one of the things about vector drawing is it is a totally different tool. And people think about vector, like drawing on the computer as not being real drawing and stuff like that, and that it's computer art and it's not like drawing from scratch or hand lettering. Um, to which my usual argument is that unless you are drawing from the ink flowing from, or the blood flowing from the tip of your finger, you are not drawing by hand. You know, a pencil is a tool that you have over time learned to use. And when you're drawing with a pencil, and you're good at drawing or you're practiced at drawing, you're not thinking about the point where the pencil hits the paper. You're thinking about where the pencil's going, right? And that's just something that happens as you learn how to draw, because if we were just staring at that point on the page, like if you watch little kids draw, that's what they're doing with a the crayon. They're like staring at that point, and you can see their eyes following that point around the page. Um, you just ne you're not going to end up with a drawing that is probably what you envisioned in your head because you're not seeing the big picture, you're just seeing that little micro moment. And vector drawing is very similar to that too. When you first start drawing, you're focused so much on what's here that you forget about what's to come, or you just assume that like, Ooh, when the ne next point is there, then I'll know what's to come, blah, blah, blah. But eventually you start being able to think ahead and really start thinking about how this point's going to affect the next point's going to affect the next point. So I am going to make sure that I cruise through some more of this stuff because I want to go over like crazy. So here's what the final vector of that guy looked like. And here's what the final vector of that guy looked like. And so even when I'm doing vector art, I'm still kind of repeating this like skeleton body and the last thing is the clothes. So the clothes are the thing that we all think about first when we think about letter forms because we're like, I love all that fancy nonsense all over that. Um, but really, you, the fancy nonsense gets added after the body is in place. You know, I feel like you would recognize me no matter which outfit I was wearing because I have a specific shape and form and, you know, whatever that um, is adjusting every day now. But, um, <laughs> but for sure, it's not the clothes that define me. It's like, it's the, the full package, the body and the skeleton and everything. So uh, everyone's, as a designer, your natural inclination is to focus on the clothes, but you really have to work at um, focusing on the other stuff as well. And so when I'm working in vector, a lot of times I'll use kind of like a vector skeleton to help correct some of the things that are going on in my drawing. So in this case, um, like this is just taking the word probably out of that sketch, I had some spacing issues that I knew were gonna get corrected once I was working in vector. So depending on how complicated my sketch is or how much I wanna adhere to it, I can uh, decide whether or not I wanna trace it exactly or whether I want to use it as a guide and then turn it off and not let it affect all of my work entirely. So here, this is the very technical part. So if some of you guys have never opened Illustrator, this is going to be like Swahili to you. Um, but this is, this is literally all that you need to know about vector drawing right here. So it's really easy to know where to plot points on a rectangle, right? Because there's these hard edges of where the points go. And the way to ask yourself, like, where does the point end up going on a vector path is where is the path changing directions? So on a rectangle, it's really easy because you're like, oh, it's a left-hand turn, it's a right-hand turn. There's really clear points in which the direction is changing. But on a curve, it's a lot more difficult. So you really want to point at the beginning and the exit of every curve, right? And if you think about a circle, the way that Illustrator uh, plots points around a circle, there's four points on a circle. There's a north, south, east, and west point, and that's because every time that a circle takes a quarter turn around, that's when you're going to want a point. You can get by with doing a circle with three points, but these four points are going to be your favorite thing in the whole world. And then um, the, where, the place that the points go also matters, and that I did not learn about until I started working with type, because they do not teach you this in school, because it's not a necessity. It's not one of those things that you absolutely need to do because you can make pretty beautiful vector art without caring at all where the points go. And it just takes longer to do it and it takes a lot more finessing. But type designers work by plotting points on the extrema of a letter form. 
And you can take this to any vector draw that you do. You can do it for logos or for icons or for illustration, whatever. And so what that means is that the points are always on the extreme north, south, east, and west of a shape. And what that does is it allows you to make these handlebars so the, the little dot is the vector point and then the things that come off of it are the handlebars. And if you can keep those perfectly vertical or perfectly horizontal whenever you can, what that's awesome is that you can actually edit a lot easier than when you're dealing with um, a point placed in a random place because if I can, I can hold down the shift key and just affect that one handlebar rather than affecting that whole side of the form. So you know how it is, like anybody that's worked in Vector, where you start editing and like every time that you move something, you mess up another thing over here and all of a sudden it feels like this vicious cycle where nothing is ever going to be right. This is a way to make sure that you're only affecting little bits at a time. And that it can't happen in every instance, for sure, when you're plotting stuff that's on, like, the letter A has, this, um, you know, the diagonal that comes down. Then you follow the, I have a point where the path shifts directions. Straight, 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 starts to curve, there's a point, stops the curve, there's a point, straight, straight, straight. So that's how you sort of remember where that goes. So when I start drawing scripts, I start by drawing the, uh, the points on the north and south. And the only reason why I start with these is because the less points I have, the easier it is for me to edit. So that goes back to the live tracing stuff where when you have way too many points, it's like impossible to edit stuff. So if I want to make some big major decisions about things, I'm going to keep my points to a minimum first. And then the love on the bottom has the east and west points added, and these are like the correct versions to end up with, and that helps with rendering and all kinds of stuff. Other things to look at is how much work these handlebars are doing individually. So if you have, um, every time that you have a curve, there's two points that affect the curve, and um, the handlebars should be doing pretty equal work. They don't have to be like perfect equal, but one should not be doing way more work than the other, which is what you see in the second image. And that's gonna make it a lot easier to make smoother curves. You're gonna get way less dimples in your work if you start realizing that like, a lot of times when a curve looks a little bit weird, it's because one handlebar is doing way too much work and one handlebar is doing way too little. And then the last thing that you want to do uh, to reference like some nerd technology is don't cross the streams. Um, so the handlebars should never cross each other and they should never be implied to cross each other as well. So if you look on the, the very far right image, um, that one handlebar is not actually crossing the other one yet, but it looks like it will cross its path at some point, that is also bad. What this means is that your points generally just need to scoot up closer to the edge of the curve rather than making the, the handlebars themselves do all the work. So anyway, I promise we're almost done with the really technical stuff. Um, another thing that I notice in people that are fresh at vector stuff is that they have these points that are like super duper duper pointy. It almost looks like this hairline that goes to forever, and that's because there's too few points. So if you just lop off the end of that, you still get a very like pointed uh, shape without actually um, having it be extremely like hyper crazy computery pointy. Um, I could go, I could seriously talk for like five hours about all this stuff, which is sad, but you know, I could. And then uh, the image on the right is just to show like when you're when you're drawing, you create overlaps within the letter forms, whether that's like you know, keeping the crossbar as a separate rectangle, or in the case of this A, there's this little triangle up at the top there instead of it just being one point, and what that does is it means I can select the whole side of that A and tap it over to make it thicker instead of just moving over one point, which then makes me have to move a bunch of other stuff and I have to freehand it and blah, blah, blah. So all these sorts of things you just kind of pick up as you work, like hopefully someone is, you know, briefing you about all these things to do. I'm actually, like, these, all these illustrations come from um, a book I've been working on for the last year and a half, which is going to get released, I think, at the end of the summer. Um, they gave me the pub date when I signed the contract a year and a half ago, but I have since forgotten, and I'm lazy, and I haven't looked it up. And so I know that it'll probably be out by the fall, but it walks through all this stuff in even more detail, so if you're interested in seeing it in the future, that's where it's going to be. And so when I'm drawing then, I'm thinking about things in terms of line and shape. So the shape um, is represented in red and the line is represented in blue. And sometimes I'll combine those two. Sometimes I'll draw the thing as all shape. It depends on how like really perfectionist -y I'm being that day. If I'm working on a logo, I'm not going to leave things as both line and shape. I have to make sure it's all outlined and perfect so the client can use that. 
And then uh, this is sort of what the final project for that guy ended up looking like when you can see all those shapes overlapping each other, just to show like sort of how I end up building some of that stuff. Anyway, so that's the whole process. Now I'll show you some projects real quick. Um, so when I this is the uh, final assignment for something for the New York Times. So this is what the final vector artwork looked like, and these are what some of the process <laughs> sketches that I showed are. So when I do sketches, I really try and show a range of ideas rather than just showing one idea executed in four different ways. Um, and occasionally I'll do mock-ups and stuff like this so that uh, the client gets a better idea of what it actually looks like in context rather than just showing the, the sketch. Um, so for this one, I had to come up with like, what is love? Baby donor, blah, blah, blah. And uh, <laughs> so coming up with kind of an idea of what love uh, means in an abstract way can be you know, difficult. But again, like this is one of those assignments that kind of comes your way again and again. People love love, you know, as they should. And um, so the one that they ended up picking, my idea behind it was just about how like whenever you're in a relationship that involves love, there's this real intertwining between you and that person or you and that object or whatever. Um, where all of a sudden your lives become so inseparable that it's like a knot you can't untie. So that was really where that uh, idea came through. And so anytime I'm sending stuff to clients, I'm really trying to explain these ideas as much as I can. And so um, this is one of the things that I really try to think about when I'm making work because people look at lettering and type and think about it as being all surface and decoration. When really, um, you want to make sure that there's as much substance to it as possible. It's not just about style, um, that everything has substance and style to it. So even with my daily drop cat project, you know, if I go through, this is like a, di a diary of what was going on in my life because there's, you know, every day that something happened, it'd be like, oh, that's when I was at that conference and I made something that looked like the conference logo, or that's when I was listening to a lot of Mariah Carey, you know, and then, <laughs> like each of these things has like a weird little concept that's super specific behind it. And so um, when I got contacted by Penguin to do this project, which was Penguin Drop Caps, which was just like one of the most fun and epic assignments that I've had so far in my career, um, which was to illustrate 26 book covers, um, which they were going to release as kind of like a collection through the Penguin Classics. It's called Penguin Drop Caps. Um, I really wanted to approach these all like very differently. So a lot of people thought that I was just reappropriating letter forms from the Daily Dropcat project, but each of these is really based on the content of the book. And because representing a book in a more abstract way um, is difficult, you really have to read the book. So I spent like a year and a half just reading a ton of books, um, which was really cool, because like I said, when I was in high school, I wasn't much of a reader. You know, I actually transferred high schools right when my Catholic school was switching from grammar to, um, to literature, and right when the high school was, the uh, public school was switching from literature to creative writing. So I basically went from super intense grammar for four years to creative writing. So I missed a lot of the opportunities of reading some of these books when I was younger. And so for the sketches for these, I definitely tried to show like a few different concepts um, for each one. So um, when, like when I see them all together, it's really kind of crazy. They're of course not arranged this way in my sketchbook because they kind of happened at different times um, over the course of a year. Um, but I would get you know three or four books at a time to read and then have to really brainstorm and come up with ideas for what I was going to do. And you can really tell um, whether I was into a book or not based on how many concepts I had. <laughs> so the O here was for John O'Hara's um, Butterfield 8, which if you guys haven't read it, it's really an awesome, it was like a real page turner. And it's uh, set in like kind of Prohibition era in New York and there's like fast and loose women and danger and stuff. It's, it was like really fun. So I had all these ideas of what I wanted to do about speakeasies and drinks and blah, blah, blah. So that one was the only one that I think I had done five sketches for and everything else, it was usually like three options, sometimes a little less. And so one of the books that I really enjoyed was a children's book called Five Children and It, um, which I could not get past this book because the character they describe in it is this sand fairy that grants wishes to, of course, very selfish children. And um, he was this little gremlin dude that had bat wings for ears and snail eyes. And it is the stuff of nightmares, for sure. So I was like, I have to work this guy into the sketch no matter what, because he was just so memorable of a character. So all the sketches that I showed incorporated him in like a little way, whether it was him granting the wish or it was him 
Um, the uh, N in the center is like the wish that is granted, which is all golden and awesome. And then after sunset, it turns back into a normal wish. Um, and the last one, of course, since they're greedy children, they wish for tons of gold coins. And so the coin disintegrating. And then uh, this is just to illustrate why I don't use live trace. So the one on the left is a live traced version of my sketch. As you can tell, it's beautiful and perfect for a finalized cover. Um, the one on the right is the actual final artwork I created. So there's a lot of decisions that are happening at every single stage. And what's really nice about that is that I never feel intimidated that I have to solve everything at one point in the project. You know, like, I want to solve the idea first, and then once the idea is solved, then I can start solving the layout, then I can start solving the, uh, you know, decoration and stuff like that. So by the time even I do this sketch, I'm like, oh, you know, it'll have some swirly stuff around it. You know, you get it. And then <laughs> when I'm actually working on the vector, I get to decide how much swirly stuff happens. And so I have a little video of me doing that just to show you guys how the vector drawing happens. So I'll only play this for a second because I don't want to go too far over time. And I don't think this is sped up because um, I, dr I draw pretty quickly and really what I would be doing is I wouldn't even be correcting this stuff as I go. I would just be like super rough, get it on the page, and then I would spend all my time correcting. What I do find is that people that are starting in vector drawing, they spend a lot of their time correcting every single thing as they go, rather than just vomiting all the like vector points onto the page and then like massaging it into goodness. And what's really good about that is like you really should think about like getting as much out as you can, like making the project take as much shape as possible and working on it all together rather than working on these little tiny bits at a time. Because if you work on it like where you're just trying to perfect this little upper section of it, then all of a sudden you can step away and say, why did I spend so much time on that? Because actually the whole thing is screwed up. You know, like I wouldn't have seen the fact that the whole thing is screwed up had I not stepped away to look at it. And so now a lot of the projects that I work on get to look like crazy things like cookies and swan lattes and things like that. Uh, these are epic, like I, I worked on these for Starbucks and I worked on, I, I'll show you exactly what I delivered to them. They did all this crazy hard work and they made mold makings of uh, cookies and, and actually made physical chocolate samples and photographed them and stuff like that. But the kind of stuff that I hand over um, looks a lot more like this, where I'm handing over black and white sketches um, that are just sort of these weird layouts. Again, like when people look through my sketchbooks and see these, like I have, what is this, like a cylinder waiting to eat something? Like, you know, you have no <laughs> idea what it is when you see that in context. And then when I, when I show it to the client, I usually try to mock it up like a little bit, especially if it's kind of a weirder, uh, a weirder layout. And so the art on the right is my final art. That is what I finalize and what I deliver to the client. So like a lot of times you get to see these really sexy, awesome projects, but that's not what my day to day is. That's not how I'm working. And so that's why it's really important to sort of like love your process and love the journey as much as you love the destination. Because a lot of times things get killed. You know, you'll work on assignments and before things get to go to the printer, they just die. And if you hated working on it, if you did not like the process, if you were like not a road trip kind of person, um, then you are not gonna have a lot of fun in your career. So you need to find a, a career, whatever it is, where like just sitting there in the car for 18 hours is the thing that is the most enjoyable thing. Because when you finally get to Vegas and are like, what? You know, <laughs> you need to make sure that that trip there was super enjoyable. And so this is a, another similar assignment um, for Dove, where they actually made these out of metal and then covered them in chocolate and photographed them. And then I'm sure used all sorts of crazy post-production stuff to make them look delectable. Um, but this is what I actually ended up handing over to them. And I didn't show uh, this part of the assignment to the folks last night, but I was really tricky with this and ended up making a, a crappy typeface for my own use for this project, which was more work than I needed to do, but I had to do four posters at the time, and I was like, you know, I'm just gonna toss these into Font Lab, and that way I can just like type it out, and then I can make changes to it um, so that it's just easier for me rather than dragging and dropping all these letters over and over again. 
But that paid off big time because they came back a year later and were like, oh my god, Jessica, we're in a crazy crunch and we need four more of these things. Do you think you can do it? And I was like, I don't know. Let me check my calendar. <laughs> you know, of course I said nothing about the fact that I had made this font. And then, um, but anyway, it was a year later, so I had to make all these like changes to it anyway because nobody does work a year ago that then they go back and say, it's perfect, let's go with what I did a year ago because that was exactly what it should be now. Uh, but what I did end up doing is I had to kind of reverse engineer the sketch, so I ended up type, like I, I redid a lot of the letter forms in the typeface, and then I typeset it, and then I traced it, <laughs> and then sent that as the sketch, and then they were like, we love it! And I'm like, perfect, it's just going to take me another week then to do the final, and when really all I had to do was like add uh, swatch to it. <laughs> that was like, go just. I know I don't have a lot of those moments, but I'm like, really nailed it. And that was so typefaces to me, like as much as I am a type designer technically, because I have created typefaces, um, I utilize it more as a tool than anything else. And I think that that's where type design can become part of your graphic design career, is that you don't have to be doing it full time in order to like use it to your advantage. So. Um, for this assignment, I got hired by CAA to design their um, Oscar party invite. Um, this is for the second year. And so these are what some of the sketches look like for that guy. And we wanted to go with an old Hollywood vibe, so I looked at a lot of uh, uh, titles from older movies, which was really fun. And But I had this sans serif that I knew that I was going to be incorporating a lot, so rather than, again, doing the drag and drop thing all the time in Illustrator, I was like, let me just make a half-baked typeface for this. Because then any time that I use it, I can just type it out real quick. It's not going to be kerned well, it's going to have terrible spacing, whatever. But it's going to be really useful for me, and that's fine. And it ended up being a really fun assignment, um, just because since this is a much less crazy thing than making a connecting script or anything like that, like a job assignment, I was able to expand it relatively quickly, and then ended up turning it into a commercial typeface. So this one's called Silencio Sands, because it reminds me of silent films. And, uh, uh, it's a sort of like small caps uh, typeface, but I didn't, I sort of intended it to almost be like two different typefaces that you can uh, use together. So that's what the environment for type design sort of looks like. You're working on these individual letters at a time. And so rather than it being like an artboard in Illustrator where you're looking at the full thing all at once, you're looking at these components. And what's really great though is that you can actually work in components a lot. So um, this slide here shows an H that's actually made up of two different characters. So then if in the future I see this swash and I'm like, oh man, that swash is crashing into everything. It's too long or whatever. I can make a change to the swash and it changes it everywhere that it shows up in the font rather than me having to go and copy paste, copy paste, copy paste like how you would have to do in Illustrator. And so um, that H is taken from Buttercream, which is kind of an updated version of a font, Buttermilk, that I created and then um, I'll show you sort of what you end up doing for that guy. So these are called spacing strings. And this I won't give you like the full like type design. Hey, this is how you do type design. Um, but one of the things that's really different is that like um, like an engineer or something, you're thinking about how everything affects everything else. You're not just thinking about like this has to happen one time and that's that and whatever. And all I have to do is draw the word violet and then it's on a book cover and that's the end of it. You have to think about what happens when people take the word violet and rearrange it to be like. T V O Y A whatever. And then so all the letter forms have to work together perfectly. So what you're doing is you're spacing it and, and looking at all the letter forms next to each other all the time as you're working. So you start with what are contro called control characters. And usually for sans serifs or serifs, it's the N and the O. And that's because the N has two straights and the O has two curves. So you can always see how the space things are going to space against each other that way. So you make your N and your O, and, and for the uppercase it's H and O. And then you space them against each other so that you type out like N O N O O O O N N N and like everything has to look like it's spaced pretty much the same. And then what you do is you type all of the letters next to those two characters and use those as the ways the way to space anything. So you never touch your spacing on your N and your O after that point, but you touch the spacing on everything else. And this is the way that you make a typeface that has kind of minimal kerning to it. So kerning is the space between the letter forms. But that's what you do when you're fixing stuff that wasn't already solved by the spacing. So anyway, like the real, like the, uh, whatever, the crystal goblet is uh, to make a typeface with no kerning in it. 
So like that's what you're always shooting for is like, how can I make something that if people set the kerning to zero, which is the opposite of what you should do um, in InDesign, um, then the typeface still looks good. If you guys wanted to know the actual thing that you should do, it should always be set to auto or metrics, auto metrics, not to optical. Um, everyone always thinks it should be optical, but optical strips away all of the type designer's kerning and then just imposes its own kerning because Illustrator's like, we know what you want. Um, <laughs> so don't do that. And don't set it to zero because it just takes everything away and slams all the letters up against each other. So um, the last couple things I'll show you are some logo type assignments. So I was able to redesign MailChimp um, earlier, I think it was about a year and a half ago at this point. And so this was a really fun assignment because I got to utilize all of my nerd skills for it in a major way. But one of the biggest takeaways for it that I discovered is that with something like a subtle rebrand um, where I'm doing things that not everyone really can see, education is so important. So I ended up, um, I, I showed this to my client along the way and like me and the client had this real buddy-buddy relationship. So we were having a lot of discussions over the things that I was doing. So it wasn't like, I wasn't just presenting him like, ta-da, like, it's done, and that's that. You know, we were having a lot of talks about why I was doing the things that I was doing. And so when I posted it to my website, I really wanted to explain some of the things that were going on in the revamp um, and why I had made those changes. So um, I just posted these images really quickly, and it took off like crazy, and like Fast Company wrote about it, and all these people were cross-posting. Then all of a sudden, a lot of clients came my way that were like, we want you to do to us what you did to MailChimp. And it's not anything different than any logo type designer could do, it's just the fact that I was letting them into my world. And so a lot of times, um, actually walking people through your process and walking them through all the magic really helps getting people to trust you and getting people to get excited about what it is that we do. Because really, like, we're in a, a post-mystery age in so many ways, if you think about it. Like, you know, we post everything that we do in our life on the internet in some way or another, even if you're the most private person in the world and your Facebook profile is only visible to you and your dog. Um, there's, it exists out there, you know, like that you will not escape without having something about you on the internet. And then um, when it comes to graphic design, you know, we're past a time in which you hire a designer and they say, trust me, this is my expertise. I'm never gonna explain to you what the secret sauce is because I'm afraid that once you know the secret sauce, you won't want to hire me anymore. People love the secret sauce. The secret sauce is awesome. And the secret sauce gets them really excited about what graphic design and what lettering actually is. So that's why I spread my secret sauce all over the earth. I love it, <laughs> you know? It's really fun sharing that secret sauce. And then it gets everybody, like making whatever we do more accessible to other people doesn't cut you off from people. It doesn't make people want to take over your job. It doesn't make people want to steal your clients. It just gets them excited about what it is that you're doing and it makes our world a little bit more accessible to other people. And people want to hire people that they understand. You know, They want to hire people that they feel like they have a connection to. So the very last one I'll show you, which is just to show you a little bit of process, is uh, a logo I did for Contact Energy. So this one was a little bit different because I really wanted to do a lot of um, analog exploration up front. And they had the tightest brief ever when they came to me, this, uh, this company design works in New Zealand. And so they had done like a 40 page deck using Bello script, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with because it was a very popular typeface over the last couple of years. And I thought for sure like that this is what they wanted. They wanted me to do variations on Bello script. So, because they were um, other graphic designers, I thought I could run it very much like how MailChimp went, where it was like super informal, I was sending them sketches, we'd schedule a phone call, talk about the sketches, you know, it was kind of like this very buddy-buddy informal thing. And it was not like that at all with them. They definitely wanted me to do like really intense, very professional decks, even though they were going to just take from my decks and put them in different decks, which was frustrating. Um, but it really taught me a lot just about how like important really framing all of your work in context and presentation is. Um, so I'm not showing you like the whole PDFs and stuff of what I, I ended up sending them, but this was the first round that I sent, which was we had a communication error where I looked at the very tight thing that I that they did, and I thought that they wanted me to rip on that very tight thing when really they were like, oh, that was just all placeholder, and they just forgot to mention that. Um, so. Uh, 
And we basically had to scrap the whole thing and start over. And what I really found out what they wanted is they wanted something that was looser, more handwriting, based on brush scripts. And the best way to make brush scripts is to actually use brushes. So I made just hundreds of the word contact with all kinds of brushes. Like I have a bunch of, my studio mate, Eric Marinovich, has way more analog tools than I do because he's way better at experimenting in that way. So I just bum his sets off of him all the time. And it's really great because to spend a whole day just surrounded by tracing paper just all over your office and then getting your little Fisker scissors to like cut them out and like arrange them and figure out which ones are different from another, it's really fun. So the ones on the left were sort of like a, like a culling from the hundreds that I did and the ones on the right were my favorites of that. So when I went to show them the, um, the actual exploration that I did, I showed them the ones on the right and then included a page of all the ones on the left to say, and here's some of the other stuff that I showed, but these were the ones that were really different from one another that I felt, um, you know, felt right for the project. And they were like, this is amazing. This is totally closer to what we wanted. So when it came to doing explorations, you know, because I had to do a little bit of work to get them back on my side because we had this major rift up front in the project, I don't usually go forward vectorizing like this much work um, when I'm working on a logo. Usually we try to land on one uh, direction and then, you know, refine from there. But I ended up refining three different ones. And these are some of the initial um, things that, that happened. They were really concerned about making sure that it felt very like hand done and that it, like there were things about the letter forms that could not be done with a typeface, even though literally you could do anything with a typeface these days because of open type. Um, so we tried all these cool like ligatures and connections and stuff that would really be uh, something that they felt they could own and could really represent the company uniquely. And so we ended up going for the direction on the left and they really liked this like uh, slash through the, the design. And then even then it was, we got to explore different ways to handle that. So the further you get along in the project, you're then just like focusing in on these little bits and you have to really be smart about you know, when to push back on things and when to, you know, let people explore everything they want to explore. Um, and so that's sort of where the final ended up. So lastly, I will end on some practical tips that have nothing to do with graphic design. Because um, you guys, a lot of your students, and these are just things, I'm 30 now, you know, I'm, I've lived a little, you know, not really. Everybody that's over 30 is like, screw you, you're still thinking. <laughs> and, uh, but these are some things from, that I've, I've taken away from my 20s. Always assume you're dehydrated. We're all dehydrated all the time. You should be drinking water right now. Um, we are indoor cats, graphic designers. We spend way too much time inside. Take vitamin D. If you're unhappy, you likely are vitamin D deficient. Take some vitamin D. Um, quick crack in your neck it really will screw you up. Just don't do it. Like, you know, I know that it feels so good and it's real satisfying and it creeps your friends out, but just <laughs> Invest in a good toothbrush. I got a Sonicare. I swear to God, I've never loved a piece of technology more than this toothbrush. <laughs> and like, I, I waited for months for that first iPhone, and when I got it in my hands, I thought it was like the best thing I'd ever seen. I don't think I've experienced enthusiasm for a device other than my toothbrush. It's crazy. And then the last thing, which is the most important, is do not eat mediocre bread or dessert, because life is too short for either. If you are going to indulge in a vice, make it the best vice. You know, like don't don't settle for crappy vices. Go for like the top notch vices. Anyway, that's all. Thank you guys. Thank <laughs> you.